insects like bees and ladybugs and all kinds of um, we even get monarchs that come lay their eggs there and the, every year. So, um, and I think the farm is looking at some of the most important keys is really a long-term benefits. So it's not thinking about just what's good for today, but um, that that's when it, we only have a three-year lease right now, which is going to expire for new routes in November. So we are actually all going towards the city council to tell them we need and to extend our lease. We can't actually build something worthwhile without knowing that we have a secure future. Because as farmers, as, as Bilal is saying in the video, we're starting with the soil and it's taking a lot of time to recreate, build. But there's a ton of resources from an urban environment of waste that we could be using to build soil, but it takes time. And um, the, the time, we need to know that this is not just leftover piece of land that you can use to kind of do something until there's a better use. And that's how, you know, things are kind of treated. We want to make sure that food is not going away. We all need to eat. And this is not something just a fad. It's, it's really, it's going to stay here. So let's treat it as if it's, you know, it's a long-term commitment that people want it to be part of. So, um, we, we, we want to welcome you guys anytime. Um, come on down. We volunteer, volunteer. Our next volunteer day is on the 23rd of April. And we, it's from 9 to 12 usually. We welcome people to come out. We give a tour around, talk a little bit more about what's happening there and do a little work in the garden. And thank you all for coming. Maybe we want to kind of see if you guys have more questions for all the people who spoke. Yeah. I'm just curious what you're talking about this land. Is it city owned land? Is that why they're all this? Yeah, it is city owned land. Um, and it's so it's city owned land, and there's a little bit of actually, if you've heard of all the garden permitting process pieces that are going on, um, it won't affect this piece of land because of being next to the creek. So it's a zoning it's totally separate. It's kind of like a higher level of difficulty that we didn't want to go for we just wanted to ask the city for like more of an easy fit residential and commercial industrial areas which gardens most likely will be now allowed um, almost for free as far as a permitting is concerned but our land still because if you're next to any creek or canyon which is the case for many urban areas um, because that's the only land left it wasn't there, you know, there wasn't, it's not a surprise that all the land is being used for something else. And this little piece of land was really a difficult piece of land for any developer to come and develop it. It wasn't really worth their time. It was a very weird shape. And, um, and then kind of the, the backing against the creek would kick it into a lot of money for say condos or something else to be developed there. Yeah, does that answer your question? Would, would there be a big if it were just if somebody owned the land, a private person. I mean, if I wanted to put a community garden on a piece of land, would that be a private permit? Yes, it would. If you are also well, one yes, in anywhere, even if it's a it's a public or a private piece of land, um, community garden requires a permit. Now, hopefully, they would be able to move it through a little faster, and that's where the money kind of gets larger is if they, they have a lot of things that they have to review um, but there was even a man who was wanting to put a community garden on his property but he was up against a cre uh, canyon and so he would have had the kind of the same issue that new roots went through probably at least a forty thousand dollar kind of process um, and you know that's something you want to make sure some people feel you know it's a very sensitive subject when you start talking about our canyons and our creeks and i agree i'm i also believe we believe in an ecological relationship but i believe that there's a what we're promoting is a farming system that can can benefit and not just see it as two different separate things that oh farming is dangerous next to a creek area uh, Maybe someone can, you know, mostly you'll find farming settlements around where there's water. Um, there's anything you want to say something about? Yeah, like, it's not a dangerous, we have seen the bad right there. 
that that's a good good example, yeah. good sign, showing that we are not farming is not something bad. We are creating natural habitat. That bad, it shows something. There's something there they never seen this before. Now they are realizing there's something. The nature has been brought back, and they are coming to visit that area. And at the day the bird was landing there, I was so surprised. And the day that they are taking the interview, and when I was talking at the, to the camera person, look, they get, get the bird over there. Then she really gets it. Was it a giant, um, like gray hair? Yeah, yeah. Gray hair. hair. Yeah, it was huge. So it came up from the creek. It just flew into the garden, and right when we were filming, you couldn't see it very well, but it's it was huge, and yeah. Those are things that we need to tell people. Like farming is not something bad, and we can be next week. We can be next to something, but we are not doing or crime doing a crime or something. We are growing food, and this is a good exercise. You see, the nature's adapting. The nature's are coming. We have been there for two years. And I've seen new friends and families are coming there. And that is the first question I ask the farmers. How do you feel like a squirrel or a rabbit eats your crops? They give me a positive answer. They say, I feel like I'm, I'm contributing to the nature. I don't feel like it's sad. They are there to share. We are here in this world to share and exchange. So if I didn't grow there, where could they get that food? So we are doing some, we say really something amazing jobs doing, done by the Yeah, yeah, it's true. A lot of um, we've seen even a red tail hawk, a residential red tail hawk, come around. Several new like bird species have been now like kind of living on site. You know, the big concern is about hill issues. You know, it's just be so close to the creek. They're scared that you know, imagine it rains so hard and it'll be flooded and gonna be, you know, like food issues, you know, like hell issues, you know, so it contaminate the food and people take it home and eat it. That's, that's the big concern, but it's, I've been here the last 18 years now, I never see Santa Fe flood one yet, and especially behind that creek, I don't think it's going to be flooded at all, you know, and it just, that's, that's the big concern, it's scared of, oh, if, if it gets flooded, what happens to food, how people are going to take, still take food home and cook and eat, and people are going to get six out of it, going to pay more money on the, on the hospital bill. But that's not the point, though. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you decide who within your community gets a plot? And then are there requirements as to how you're supposed to use it? What I mean by that is, could somebody simply come in and, and grow their plot to sell? Or are there some requirements that they need to have it grow for their own personal use, for their own families? Actually, so we have 80 families, and we always um, we have mostly uh, RC giving us mostly independence. Like we want the leaders and the growers, the farmers to be independent, make their own rules. So what we have, the each community have 20 plots. Then I have my own my waiting of list. I know all of them they're not gonna they know they don't have chance to get a plot because it's the piece of land is too small. So. And uh, what we do, first of all, we have some, and um, this is the first step we do. Uh, you get the plot, and uh, what you pay, you pay like $60 for the whole year for a water bill. And then, um, and you can grow whatever you want, except uh, in like an uh, illegal something that you don't want to have problems. <laughs> but you can grow whatever you want to grow. Nobody's like, yeah, you can grow this, you can grow this. We don't do that. We don't tell, we don't tell people like that. With well, this, some forms you sign, maybe getting wrong with the neighbors. You know, America, I don't like to sign paper, liability form like those. But we have to do it in, when you have to, you have to sign papers. So we sign, you sign paper for the parking structure and, and, and how mostly uh, conserve, conservation is our key. And this is the time you can water, this is the time you don't have to water, so we don't have to have any complaints and things like that. So. And uh, I still have some waiting list. If somebody say I'm tired uh, this, and or they are moving to another place, then I call the next person on that list. And, and we don't want because we don't have a limit time. You don't have to say like you found for one year and uh, just we kick you out. I bring new 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 person. I don't think that's fair. As long as somebody have been utilizing and soil amendment and put their time and 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 money there, and we don't want that to happen like that. So. 
And the pastor will say, we have seen that. People say, okay, I have to, to give to my friend or now I can do it. So that's how we switch it. Um, and just to add on that, I, I don't, we, IRC started it as a, as a, a pathway for, IRC is a refugee resettlement agency. We um, originally even kind of started the whole idea also as a pathway to agriculture for many folks who don't have employment. And we saw that maybe there's a fit, that some folks who came from countries where they, they, they're agrarian people, they love farming, they have skill in it, and may, there's a growing, there, aging population of farmers. Do we have a match maybe here? And we can help facilitate people to jobs. So essentially, IRC, the New Roots is also a little bit of, started as like a, you know, a test kind of site. Get out there. This is the first time people have farmed in a long time. Maybe they thought they liked farming back where, back where they knew it, but here's a little bit different ball game. So see if you like it still. You know, do you want to do this? Um, the climate's totally different. The, there's a lot of different kind of food. This getting, um, maybe you don't want to be a farmer here in the United States, but that's for them to decide, for people to get that test. You know, kind of go through it and see if you like it, if you don't. And then we, we leave it, we see it as an option. Some will want to maybe go, they're going to a next step. We've, with those who are interested, we've brought them to now access five acres of land so they can do a more intense farming program. We have a shortage of local fresh food, and I don't see any reason why we got to stop anybody from producing it locally here. I, I love it when I can, we are the only, only stall at the market that can say, the food was grown here in City Heights and sold here in City Heights, and the money remains in City Heights. And you can't find that, you know? There's no other place, and even in, and you can't say like, oh, Hillcrest Farmer's Market, this was grown in Hillcrest. You know, it didn't, you, it was grown in Hillcrest, the, the sold in Hillcrest, and the money stays in Hillcrest, no. It's the only place in town as that example. So um, we encourage people to, to sell, but obviously a lot of people needing food for their families first. So 75% of our food does go for home consumption and only really about 30% is being sold off. Um, for those people who really want to do more of an agricultural venture, they tell me, Amy, I want more land. Give me more land. This 600 square feet is not big enough. Please give me more. So those are the folks that actually we, we start trying to get them on larger plots of land. So they have kind of the small piece that's close to home, but can we look at bigger plots a little bit further away? Yeah. Um, first of all, this is fabulous. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the seed source, because I know that they sell GM seeds in all the seed catalogs and stuff, so do you worry at all about that? About genetically modified seeds? Yeah. Um, a lot of our people save seed. There's a lot of like traditional food sources, especially amongst, um, yeah, we'll let Bob well, you know, to, to my people, the seed that we take from our homeland is bring to America and we cannot change it. Yeah, that's what we, we do do. And most of the time we tend to be seeding, uh, saving seed, you know, to, to keep a plant or two, you know, for the seed for next year. So that's, that's what we do. Most of the seed that we, we grew in over there new is the seed that we bring from home. It's our own culture food. So we, we couldn't find it in America at all, so, so that's what I mean. And do you find because it, it, like, it seems like the way that you've got it set up, they have these small pots. Mm -hmm. That's what creates the polyculture, right? Creates what? The, the small pot, pots, and mm -hmm. everybody's kind of growing something different. And right. That's what creates your polyculture. Right. That keeps those right. Pests down. Yeah, and amongst, on each of those plots, they're all a little bit different, too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also, is there a way that um, we're still finishing the video, but we're happy to give you a copy. Okay. Or by donation, you can help a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it should be about 15 minutes, so we're still um, uh, finishing it up, actually. It's but, not yeah. finished yet, we just want to show it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I imagine there are restrictions saying you can't use pesticides or food. How do these people, I mean, I compost at home because it's just a couple steps from my back door, but um, 
Um, sometimes we do what's possible um, some take care of it themselves when I can we get kind of donations of stuff um, and yeah we're in a continual kind of building soil just talking about composting um, we would we we it's actually a project we'd really like to ramp up is I personally have um, so much faith in how I even got into food was through was food through waste recycling, and so that's intriguing to me. Um, but we are producing so much food waste here in an urban environment, and we are partnering with a couple businesses, a couple local grocery stores, where we're getting their their like um, unprocessed greens, and we are adding them to our compost site. That's illegal, so I didn't really say that. <laughs> Um, but th there's, you know, a couple of local grocery stores that throw away a good 200 pounds of green waste, unprocessed. And what we do is grab that and we bring it down to the farm and kind of get our, you know, compost, compost. rocking and, you know, real add, add kind of a booster there. Is that like fruits and vegetables or just greens? It's mainly, they're sa selling mainly greens. So we just do that because it's really clean matter and they produce over 100 pounds a day of it. Why is it illegal? Uh, the, the municipal code will not allow you to take someone else's waste to compost on, so, on the site unless it's a, like a uh, maybe a city run comp uh, certified composting facility. Can it be reclassified? I think it's not waste, maybe? Yeah. yeah. You know, rather than changing the rule, change what it is? Yeah, if you're interested in the policy, one in ten is, <laughs> is looking for volunteers because we gotta keep making these policy changes. The urban agriculture thing. There's a lot to discuss about that, and um, I think they're concerned about rodents or attracting insects, and if people, how to monitor it if it becomes an unsightly or a problem, smelly, this kind of thing. So, yeah, even that, yeah, yeah. Uh, to clarify, is the garden organic then? Um. Or most, as much as you can? Be? Yeah, we, we try work. as much as we can, but only if we can get uh, certified organic, so we, we try the best we can to stay on okay. the organic. But also thinking about like the, the watershed issues and uh, the politics of being around a creek and being able to uh, say, yes, we're good. Yeah, they, they, you know, the word organic, <laughs> the word organic I had when I came to America. And uh, I, when I had organic, 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 I asked the question, what's the organic? They say it's a, a crop that doesn't contain or doesn't use pesticide and things like that. And then I have to ask, him, I ask them the question, I say, why do, why, do you have, you, do you have, why do you have to use chemical? And then, well, you know, it's a chemical, it's killing. So we now, like where I come from, we never use chemical. I would not used to that. So if we are using the same traditional growing in, in, in the same area. So, Nobody's using pesticide over there. What we do, like naturally, intercrop, add different crops that the 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 bugs doesn't like. So if you, I I I am the family cat over there. So I I meet with the grow as I say. If you having a problem with pest, if you grow one crops like one crops and then the bugs like that crops, then you lose. But you grow a little bit of different thing. So we know we are not hundred sure how to stop the bugs, but. I say, just mix the crops. If they eat this one, then you, you are left with something. And if sometimes that works too, because the bats getting confused about, about the other crops they don't like, and then they run away, they go to other places. Things like that is the best. But we don't think like putting chemical in, uh, in our crops or pesticide. I never seen that was happening to that. And uh, the first thing when we started the garden, this is when I, what happened, people questioned to me. They came to me and I say. Uh, Muya, uh, you see my crops are looking, animals are eating my crops, and uh, I, this is what I told them, yes, and uh, people because they are so confused that they're going to the store and they see these beautiful tomatoes, these cucumbers, nothing damaging to them, and those, those, that's not the nature I see. We all, even God could create us like one type of shape of people and one color, but we have short, tall, strong, black and brown, for a reason, that's the nature. The crops, the food we are eating should be the same too, should be like 
one ugly to looking tomatoes and one fine tomato. This one looks funny because they're back. Those are the things. And the, the most important things why are the bags are eating our crops. They know it. They're very smart than that. It's delicious, it's safety and it's also what? And it's healthy for them. So if the bags eat my crops and I will eat that one. Because I know it's safety for me and it's delicious and it's also health and it's healthy for me. So if the bag ran away from that crop, I will never eat it. So then my grower says, that makes sense now. People are encouraging me. You see it's looking ugly and they eat in front of me and say, that's healthy and safety and delicious. So we don't do organic, we don't do pesticides. Is there a fence around the property? Yeah, there is. Yes, that's part of the code that it's required. At chain link or? Uh, yeah, it was a big discussion and because there was also this confusion. Again, this we're, we're like, giving them a lot of trouble because they haven't had to deal with this. When you're up against a creek, you need to put a wooden rail, wooden like four feet fence. That The one, if you've ever been to the garden at um, uh, the Tijuana River Community Garden, they have like this wooden uh, slat. So they got really confused because we're in two different zones. So they, mostly they're saying we got to put a chain link, but then they got confused because then they're saying the back's supposed to be a wooden fence because it's an environmental area. So, you know, you're kind of pushing the boundaries of creating these new systems, but it ended up, they decided now one chain link. So, because it wouldn't make any sense to have... No. <laughs> it doesn't. Believe it or not, we got a lot of those problems. <laughs> if you can't have us, please. <laughs> we now need an owl. <laughs> yeah, we'll take one more question. Do you share um, other things as well, like tools, I'm wondering, or you mentioned maybe a little bit before if somebody has extra. I'm just wondering how the sharing goes on between the families and the different cultures. And they share, like, there's a tool shed and they share the tools. Hay una casita ahí donde vamos y las colocamos cuando ya las usamos, las limpiamos y las ponemos ahí. When they don't use the tools, they, they wash the tools and they put in the tool shed. Y si otro la necesita, se la lleva, así que las compartimos. If another person needs it, they take it. And that's how we So thank you all for coming, and um, if you can stick around, Bilali Muya is our keynote. We gotta get him over to there, and if you, he's a fascinating character. So I really appreciate you come come here more. He's very inspiring, and he's gone through an amazing journey throughout his still yeah, young more, age, uh, and he's got more to go. One more thing: the garden will be all open from sunrise to sunset. So any time they you want to drop by, you please, yeah. Any day, seven days a week from sunrise to sunset. What is the address yeah. again? Where is it located? Um, 54th and... 54th, it's about a block and a half from uh, Kmart to the right hand side. Just say Leah. Yeah, Leah. Yeah, Leah Street. It actually doesn't have an address, so yeah, it's kind of confusing. Thank you. Thank you.